welcome to Hopkins Academy Drama Club's production of Shakespeare, Monologues, Murder, and More. I'm Amy Lanham, the advisor and director of Drama Club. <laughs> and I'm delighted that you are all here. Uh, your attendance at our event helps to fund the theater arts at Hopkins Academy, and we are all very, very grateful for your contribution. The students in this cast crew and on the artistic team have worked very hard to bring you a fun and engaging performance tonight and I'm honored to work with such a dedicated and eclectic group of young people. The versatility and drive of these students has been astounding to behold. Due to unforeseen circumstances, some of these actors have only inhabited their character for two or three weeks and they have worked with tireless dedication to bring these scenes to life. I hope that you will enjoy these scenes as much as I have. And I would like to remind you that if you have a cell phone, which most of you probably do, please remember to silence it so as not to disrupt the performance. And now sit back and enjoy our show. All the world a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then, the whining schoolboy with his satchel of shining morning face, creeping like snail and willingly to school. Then, the lover, Sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then, the soldier, full of strange oaths, seems to like the pard. Jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. Then, the justice, in fair round belly with a good cap on mine, with eyes severe and feared a full more cut. Full of wise saws in modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. His youthful hose will save a world too wide. For his shrunk strength and his big, manly voice to again to a childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. The last scene of all in this strange, eventful history is second childishness in mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Hello, I'm Sarah and I'll be your narrator for this evening. I'll be introducing our characters, actors, and context for each scene so that you all can understand it better. You just watched Priscilla open our show with a monologue by Jack from As You Like It. We hope you'll enjoy our show today. Our first scene is from the comedy Twelfth Night. In this scene, there's a practical joke going on. Olivia, played by Amber, is a noble lady with a house full of hilarious characters, including a snobby servant named Malvolio, here played by Carter. When several members of her household take offense at Malvolio's constant efforts to spoil their fun, Olivia's servant, Maria, played by Abby, engineers a practical joke to make Malvolio think that Olivia is in love with him. Maria forges a letter, supposedly from Olivia, addressed to her beloved, telling him that if he wants to earn her favor, he should dress in yellow stockings and cross garters, act haughtily, smile constantly, and refuse to explain himself to anyone. Malvolio finds the letter, assumes that it is addressed to him, and, filled with dreams of marrying Olivia and becoming noble himself, happily follows its commands. As our scene opens, Olivia is asking Maria how to host a dinner for a person that she is in love with. Malvolio is called to consult, and Olivia is in for a surprise with her servant. Rocky plays an unnamed servant. I sent after him. He says he'll come. 
How should I feast him? What to bestow of him? For youth is bought more often than beggar borrowed. I speak too loud. Where is Malvolio? He is sad and civil and sees well of a servant with my fortunes. Where is Malvolio? He's coming, madam, but in a very strange manner. He is sure possessed, madam. Why, what's the matter? Does he rave? No, madam, he does nothing but smile. Your ladyship had best have some guard about you. If he come, for sure the man is changing its wits. Go, call him hither. I am mad as he is sad and merry man as he will be. How now? Malvoli. Oh. Sweet lady! Oh. Smilest thou, I sent for thee upon a sad occasion. Sad lady, I could be sad. This does cause some obstruction in the blood, this cross garter. But what of it? If it please the eye of one, it is with me as the very true sonnet is. Please one, and please all. Why, how dost thou, man? What is the matter with thee? Not black in my mind, but yellow in my legs. And it did come to his hands, and commands shall be executed. I think we do know the sweet Roman hands. Well, to them, go to bed, Malvolio. To bed? I sweet heart, and I'll come to thee. God comfort thee! Why dost smile so and kiss thy hand so oft? How do you, Malvolio? At your request, yes, nightingales answer dogs. Why appear you with this ridiculous boldness before my lady? Be not afraid of greatness. Twas well read. What meanest by that, Malvolio? Some are born great. Huh? Some achieve greatness. What sayest thou? And some have greatness thrust upon them. <laughs> Heaven restore thee! Remember who commanded thy yellow stockings. Thy yellow stockings! <laughs> <laughs> Cross garter. Cross garter. Go to thou art maid if thou desires to be so. Am I maid? If not, let me see thee a servant still. <laughs> Why? This is a miss of madness. Madam, madam, madam. The young gentleman from the Count Orsino's is returned. I could hardly entreat him back. He attends your ladyship's pleasure. I'll go to him. Good Maria. Let this fellow be looked to. by Pfeiffer has just finished a long argument with her husband, Othello, about whether or not she has cheated on him. Iago, a man jealous of Othello, has framed Desdemona for adultery, despite her never having done so. Amelia, played by Jace, is Iago's wife and Desdemona's maid. She often takes Desdemona's side, as she has grown far more loyal to her than to her husband. Desdemona asks Amelia to put her wedding sheets on her bed, as she contemplates her marriage, which she hopes to save. Both women prepare for bed as they talk of Desdemona's fate, which is in Othello's hands, and Rocky is a servant again. <laughs> Amelia, give me my knightly wearing and your due. We must not now displease him. I would you have never met him. 
so would not I. My love doth so prove him that even his stubbornness, his checks, his frowns, for the unpending, have grace and favor in them. I have wish you to be the other one. Oh, it's one. Uh, good faith. How foolish are our, are our minds. If I do die before thee, prithee, shroud me in one of those same sheets. Come, come, you talk. My mother had a maid called Barbara. She was in love, and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow. An old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune, and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I have much to do but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbara. Prithee, dispatch. Shall I put your neck back? Uh, no, unpin me here. This Lodovico is a proper man. A handsome man. He speaks well. I know a lady in Venice who wants a fair fifty pound sign for a touch of his leather look. The poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree. Sing willow, 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 willow. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knee. Sing willow, 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 willow. If fresh streams ran. Catch with moment. So get thee gone, eight eyes do itch. Doth that bode weeping? Tis neither here nor there. I have heard it said so. Oh, these men, these men! Dost thou in conscience think, tell me, Emilia, that there be women do abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? Why, would not you? No, by this heavenly light. Nor I, by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. <laughs> What's in troth, I think thou wouldst not. In troth, I think I should, and undo it when I have done. Mary, I would not do such a thing for a joint ring, nor measures of lawn, nor gowns, petticoats, nor caps, nor any petty exhibition. But for the whole world? Why, who would not make their husband a couple to make him a monarch? I should venture purgatory for it. Beshrew me if I would do such a wrong for the whole world. Why, the wrong is but a wrong in the world. In having the world, for your neighbor, tis a wrong in the world, and you might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes, a dozen, and as many to the vantage as would store the world they play for. But... I do think it is their husbands' faults, if wives do fall. Say that they slacken their duties, and pour all our treasures into foreign laps, or else break them into peevish jealousies, throwing a shrink upon us, or say that they strike us, or skint their former having in despite. Why, why we have balls, and though we have some grace, yet let us have some revenge. Let husbands know 
that their wives have sense like them. They can see and smell and have palates for both sweet and sour as husbands have. And what is it that they do when they change for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it is. And is it frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have we not affections, desires for sport, frailty, as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know. The ills we do, their ills instruct us so. Good night. Good night. Heaven may such uses send, not to pick bad for bad, but by bad men. Rocked at mountains with outstretched arms, yet parted with the shadow of his hand. What? Was it you that would be England's king? Was it you that reveled in our parliament and made a preachment of your high descent? Where are your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward and the lusty jewel. Or where is that valiant crookback prodigy, Dickie, your boy that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? Or with the rest, where's your darling Rutland? Look, York, look. I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford with his rapier's point issued from the bosom of the boy. And if thine eyes can water for his death, I give thee this to dry thy cheeks withal. Alas, poor York, but that I hate thee deadly! I should lament thy miserable state. I prithee, grieve. To make me marry thee. What, hath thy fiery heart so parched thine entrails that not a tear can fall for Rutland's death? Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I, to make thee mad, do mock thee thus. Stand brave and correct that I may sing and dance. Thou wouldst be thee, I see, to make me sport. York cannot speak unless he wear a crown. Yes, a crown for York. And lords, bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. I marry, sir, now looks he like a king. This is he that took King Henry's chair, and this is he was his adopted heir. But how is it that this great Plantagenet is crowned so soon? 
and broke his solemn oath. Well, as I bethink me, thou should not be king, not until our King Henry had shook hands with death. Will you pale your head in his glory and rob his temples of the diadem now, in his life, against your holy oath? Oh? Does the constitute to a particle? Off with the crown! And with the crown, his head! And whilst we breathe, take time to do him dead. her heart, spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. They aim at it, and botch the words up fit to their own thoughts, which, as her winks and nods and gestures yield them, indeed would make one think there might be thought. Though nothing sure, yet much unhappily. Twere good she was spoken with, for she may strew dangerous conjectures in every mind. Let her come in. To my sick soul, as such true nature is, each toy seems prolonged to some greatness. So full of artless jealousy is guilt, it spills itself in care to be spilt. Where is he, beauteous majesty of Denmark? Come now, Ophelia. Oh, God, deal with you. They say the album. 
Jacob was the baby's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. God, be at your table. And seats upon her father. Pray, let's have no words of this. But when they ask you what it means, say you this. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning bedtime. And I am made at your widow to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and up the chamber door. Let in the maid that out a maid never departed more. Pretty Ophelia. Indeed, luck, will that noble make an end on it? By gifts and by St. Charity, a lack and fly for shame. Young men will do it if they come to it, by cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. He answered, so what I had done by yonder son, hast thou not come to my bed? How long hath she been thus? I thank you for your good counsel. My brother shall know of it. Come, my coach. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. Oh, this is the poison of deep grief. It springs all from her father's death. Oh, Gertrude. Gertrude. When sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. First, her father slain, next your son gone, and he most violent author of his own just remove. The people muddied, thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers, for good Polonius is dead, and we have done but greenly in hugger mugger to inter him. Poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment, without the which we are pictures or mere beasts. Last, and as much containing as all these, her brother is in secret come from France, feeds on his wonders, keeps himself in clouds, and wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death. Where in necessity of matter beggared, will nothing stick our person to a rein in ear and ear. Oh, my dear Gertrude, this like to a murdering peace in many places, give me superfluous death. A noise within! Alack! What noise is this? Where are my Switzers? Let them guard the door. What is the matter? Save yourself, my lord. The ocean overpearing of his list eats not the flat with more impetuous haste than young Laertes with a righteous head, or bears your offices the rabble call him lord. And as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, the ratifiers and props of every word, they cry, choose we, Lerti shall be king. Caps, hands, and tongues applauded to the clouds, Lerti shall be king, Lerti is king. Oh, how cheerfully the false trail they cry, oh, this is counter, you false Danish dogs! The doors are broke! Where is this king? Sirs, I've stayed you all without. No, no let, let us come, come in! in. I we will! We will! I thank you. Keep the door. Oh, thou vile king, give me my father. Calmly, good Laertes. That drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard cries cuckered to my father, brands the harlot. Even here, between the chaste, unsmirched brows of my true mother. What is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude. Do not fear our person. There's such divinity doth hedge a king. That treason can but peep to what it would, acts little of his will. Tell me, Laertes, why thou art thus incensed? Let him go, Gertrude. Speak, man, where is my father? Dead. But not my hand! Let him demand his fill. How came he dead? I'll not be juggled with. To hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscious and grace to profoundest pit. I dare damnation, to this point I stand that both the world I give to negligence. Let come what comes, only know I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. And who shall stay you? My will and not all the worlds. And for my means, I'll husband them so well they'll go far with little. Good Laertes, if you desire to know the certainty of your dear father's death, is it writ in your revenge that sweepstake 
You will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser, none but his enemy. And you will know them then to his good friends elope thus wide my arms, and like the kind, light friending pelican, wraps them with my blood. Why now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman, that I am guiltless in your father's death, and am most sensibly in grief for it? It shall as level to your judgment pierce, as day doth to your eye. Let her come in! How now, what noise is that? Oh, he, try up my brains. Here is seven times salt for now the second virtue of mine eye. By heaven, thy madness shall be prudent with till scale turn the beam. O oh, rose of men, dear maid, kind sister, sweet Ophelia, the possible young maid's wits be as martial as an old man's life. Nature is fine in love, and where it is fine, sends some precious instance of itself after the thing it loves most. Thy wits and did pursue revenge, it could not move thus. Yet, Rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray you love, remember. Mayor Payne, that's for thoughts. Documented madness. Thoughts of remembrance, they take. There's fennels for you, and columbines. There's root for you, and here's some for me. They may call it herb of grace on Sundays, or you must wear your root with a difference. There are daisies. I would give you violets, but they rip it all when my father died. They say he made a good end. And will he not come again? Will he not come Thoughts and affliction, again? passion, hell itself. She turns in favor of prettiness. He is gone. He is gone. God a mercy on his soul. And of all Christian souls, we pray God, God be with you. Do you see this, O oh God? Laertes, I must commune with your grief, lest you deny the right. Go but apart. Make choice of whom's your wisest friends you will, and let them judge twixt you and me. If by direct or by collateral hand they find us touched, we will our kingdom give, our crown, our life, to you in satisfaction. But if not, be you content to lend us your patience, and we shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. Let this be so. His means of death is obscure funeral. No trophy, sword, no axement or his bones. No noble right, nor formal ostentation. The cry to be heard is to from heaven to earth that I must call it to question. So you shall. And where the offense lies, let the great axe fall. I pray you go with me.
Here, Maria, Olivia's servant, still played by Abby, has a conversation with Festy, Olivia's clown, played by Eli. Festy has been away for some time, and it seems nobody knew where he was. Maria tells Festy that he'll be in trouble with Olivia, and that Olivia is likely to fire him, though Festy doesn't seem too worried. Olivia, still played by Amber, arrives and angrily orders her servant, again played by Rocky, to kick Festy out of the house. But Festy, getting the witty clown that he is, manages to put Olivia in a better mood. Maria returns to tell Olivia that a young man wants to see her, but Olivia's drunk uncle, Sir Toby Welch, played by Colin, is unfortunately causing trouble and needs to be looked after. So wide as a bristle may enter and wave thy excuse, my lady will hang thee for thy absence. Let her hang me. He that is well hanged in this world needs to fear no colors. Make that good. He shall say none to fear. A good Lenten answer, I can tell thee where that saying was born of I fear no colors. Where, good Mistress Mary? In the wars, and I may be so bold to say in your foolery. Well, God get them wisdom that have it. And those that are fools, let them use their talents. Yet you'll be hanged for being so long absent, or to be turned away. Is that not as good as a hanging to you? Well, many a good hanging prevents a bad marriage. And for turning away, let summer bear it out. You are resolute then? Not so, neither. For I am resolved on two points. That if one break, the other will hold, but if both break, your Gaskins fall. Apt, in good faith, very apt. Well, be on my way. If Sir Toby leave drinking, thou wert as witty a piece of ease, flesh as any in Iberia. He's you rogue! <laughs> no more of that! My lady is coming, make your excuse wisely. You were best. <gasps> Wit, and be thy will, put me into good fooling. Those wits that have thee do very oft prove fools. For I am sure that I lack these wits. May pass for a wise man. For what says Grenopolis? Better a witty fool than a foolish wit. God bless thee, lady. Take the fool away. Do you not hear, fellows? Take away the lady. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But she, I know. <laughs> Just try. Just see what happens. <laughs> Madonna, that drink and good counsel will amend. Forbid the dry fool drink. <laughs> then is the fool not dry. Bid the dishonest man mend. If he mend, he is no longer dishonest. If he cannot, let the botcher mend him. Anything that's mended is but patched. Virtue that transgresses is but patched with sin. And sin that amends is but patched with virtue. If this simple syllogism will serve, so. If it will not, what remedy? For the only true cuckold is calamity, so beauty's a flower. The lady bade take away the fool. And therefore, I say again, take her away. <laughs> Sir, I bade them take away you. <laughs> Uh, Miss Prison, in the highest degree, Lady, who call us an unfastened Menachem? That's as much to say as I were motley in my brain. Good Madonna, give me leave to prove you the fool. Can you do it? Dexterously, good Madonna. Make your proof. Good Madonna, why mournest thou? Good fool for my brother's death. 
Oh, how do I put this lightly? Good Madonna, I think his soul is in hell. Oh, I know his soul's in heaven, fool! The more fool! The more fool to mourn for your brother's soul being in heaven! Take away the fool, gentlemen! What do you think of this fool, Malvolio? Doth he not mend? Yes, and shall do till the pangs of death shake him. Infirmity that decay the wise doth ever make the better fool. God send you, sir, a speedy infirmity for the better increasing your folly. Sir Toby will be sworn that I am no fox, but he will not pass his word for two pence that you are no fool. What do you think of this, Malvolio? I marvel your ladyship takes delight in such a barren rascal. I saw him put down the other day with an ordinary fool that has no more brain than a stone. Look you now, he's out of his garden again. Unless you laugh, Mr. Occasion, he is gagged. I protest, I see wise men that left these set kind of fools no more than the fool zanies. Oh, you are sick of self-love, Malvolio. In taste with distempered appetite, to be generous and guiltless and free of deposition, is to take those bird bolts that you can indeed bullets. There's no slander in any allowed fool, though he did nothing but rail, no railing of any no discreet man, though he did nothing but slander. Now Mercury and do thee with loosing, for thou speakest well of fools. Madam, there is a gate young gentleman much desire to speak with you. From the Count Rossino, is it? I know not, madam. It's a fair young man well attended. Who of my people hold him in delight? Sir Toby, madam, your kinsman. Go, fetch him off. Pray thee, men, fire on him. Go to, Malvolio. If it be the suit from the Count, I am not at home or sick. Would you will to dismiss it? <laughs> now you see, sir. How your fool grow old and people dislike it. But thou hast spoke for us, Madonna. As if thy eldest son were a fool who stole Jove crab with brains. And look, here comes one now, one of thy kinsmen with a most weak pie mater. <laughs> By my honor, half drunk. What is he at the gate, cousin? To a, a gentleman. A gentleman? What gentleman? Tis. There's a gentleman here, uh, a plague of these pickle herring. How now, sir? Good Sir Toby! Cousin, cousin, how have you come by this lecture so early? Let's you. Lady, I defy lecture. Why, there's one at the gate. Ah, uh, Mary, what is he? Let, let him be. Let him be the devil. I care not. Give me good faith, say I. Well, it's all one. <laughs> Sir, what is a drunken man like, fool? Well, a drowned man, a fool, and a mad man. One draft above heat makes him a fool, and the second mads him, and the third drowns him. Go thou and seek your crown. Go, look after him. He is but mad yet, Madonna, and the fool shall look to the madman. powerful magical spirit. At his master, the wizard Prospero's request, Ariel has just caused the tempest, or fierce storm, from which the play takes its name. It is Ariel's storm that begins the chaos and the action of the play, when a ship full of people is cast upon Prospero's island. All hail, great master! Brave sir! Hail! I come to answer thy best Pleasure. Be it to fly, to swim, to dive into 
fire, to ride on the curled clouds to thy strong bidding task. Ariel and all his quality. I boarded the kingship, now on the beak, now on the waist, the deck, in every cabin I flamed amazement. Sometimes I'll divide and burn in many places, on the topmast, the yards, the bowsprit, what I flame distinctly, then meet and join droves of lightning, the precursors, oh, the dreadful thunderclaps, more momentary and sight out right. We're not. We fire and cracks of the sulfurous roaring, more mighty than the most mighty Neptune seems to be seen who make his bold waves tremble, yet his dread trident shake. Not a soul but felt a fever of the mad and played some tricks of desperation. All but the mariners plunged into the foaming brine and quit the vessel. Then, all of fire with me, the king's son, Ferdinand, with his hair upstaring. Then, like wreaths, not hair, was the first man that leaped, cried, Hell is empty and all the devils are here! Shakespeare's most violent and brutal tragedy, Titus Andronicus, we have Jackson Graham as Titus Andronicus, performing a monologue of grief and anguish. In this play, the Roman general Titus returns from war with two prisoners who have vowed to take revenge against him. These prisoners, Chiron and Demetrius, played by Jackson Campbell and Colin, have raped and mutilated Titus's daughter, Lavinia, here portrayed by the unfortunate Palver. And she is accompanied by her servant, Sarah. She has lost both her hands and her tongue in her torturous mutilation. These degenerates also have Titus' sons killed and banished. In this scene, Titus has the upper hand again, having recaptured these men. They are held by his guards, played by Pfeiffer and Rocky. Here, he lets these two men know what he plans to do to them in order to take his revenge for what they have done to his children. Come, come, Lavinia, look, thy foes are bound. Sir, stop their mouths, let them not speak to me, but let them hear what fearful words I utter. O villains, Chiron and Demetrius, here stands the spring whom you have stained with mud, this goodly summer with your winter mixed. You killed her husband, and for that vile fault, two of her brothers were condemned to death. My hand cut off and made a merry jest. Both her hands, her tongue, and that more sweet than hands or tongue, her spotless chest. Inhuman traitors you constrained and forced. What would you say if I should let you speak? Villains for shame you could not beg for grace. Hark, wretches, how I mean to martyr you. This one hand debt is left to cut your throats, whilst that Lavinia, between her stumps, doth hold the basin that receives your guilty blood. You know your mother means to feast with me, and calls herself revenge, and thinks me mad. Hark, wretches, I will grind your bones to dust, and with your blood in it I'll make a paste, and of the paste a coffin I will rear, and make two pasties of your shameful heads. 
and bid the strumpet your unhallowed day, like to the earth, swallow her own increase. This is the feast that I have bid her to, and this the bank which she shall surfeit on. For worse than Philomo, you used my daughter, and worse than Progne, I will be revenged. And now, prepare your throats. Lavinia, come, receive the blood. And when that they are dead, let me go grind their bones to powder small. And with this hateful liquor temperate. And in that pace, let their vile heads be fixed. Come, come, be everyone officious to make this banquet, which I wish may prove more stern and bloody than the centaur's feast. In this scene from Romeo and Juliet, we have Romeo, played by yours truly, Mercutio, played by Ada, Benvolio, played by Pema, and another unnamed friend, Rocky. These boys are on their way to sneak in the exclusive Capulet feast and try to help Romeo get over his ex-crush, Rosaline. During their excursion, Romeo brings up a dream he had the night before, only to be interrupted by Mercutio, who gets carried away trying to convince him that dreams are nothing but imaginary products of Queen Mab, a fairy that visits people in their sleep. Romeo apprehensively gives in and agrees to attend, though we learn he had dreamed that his death would be brought upon by his attendance at this party. grasshoppers, the traces of the smallest spider's webs, her collars of the moonshine's watery beams, her whip, a cricket's bone, the, the lash of film, her wagoner, a small gray-coated gnat, not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid, her chariot, an empty hazelnut made by the joiner school or old grub, tie my mind the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state, she gallops night by night through lovers' brains and then the king of love. Or courtier's knees that dream on curtsy straight. Or lawyer's fingers who straight dream on fees. Or lady's lips who straight on kiss the stream. Which ought the angry Mab with blisters plagues because her breath with sweetmeats takes the bar. Sometimes she gallops or a courtier's nose, and then dreams he of smelling out a suit. Sometimes comes she with a tie of the pig's tail, tickling a part of his nose as he lies asleep, and then dreams he of another benefit. Sometimes she driveth or a soldier's neck. And then dreams he of cutting foreign throats of breaches, ambuscados, Spanish blades of helms, five fathom deep. And then anon drums in his ear, which he starts and wakes, and being thus frighted, swears a prayer or two, and sleeps again. This is the man that flaps the maids of horses in the night, and fakes the outlocks and foul sluttish hairs, which once untangled much misfortune bones. 
This is the hag that when maids lie on their back, presses them and learns them first to bear. This is she. Peace! Peace, Mercutio, peace. Thou talks of nothing. True. True. I talk of truth. are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air, and more inconstant than the wind, which woos even now the frozen bosom of the north, and being angered, puffs away from them, turning his side to the dew-dropping south. This wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done and we shall come too late. I fear too early for my mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars. Shall bitterly begin this fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life close to my breast by some vile forfeit of a time of death. But he that hath the seared of my course direct my sail. On, lusty gentlemen! Strike throw! In this scene from the tragedy Macbeth, it is nighttime in the castle of Dunsinane. A serving woman, played by Abby, has called the doctor, portrayed by Colin, because her mistress is acting very strangely. Her mistress is Lady Macbeth, played by Eli, who has been sleepwalking for the last several nights due to an unquiet mind. Lady Macbeth is racked by guilt as she recently conspired with her husband to kill his friend Banquo in order to gain the throne and power. In her sleep, she, reena she reenacts Banquo's murder again and again. Her guilt eventually leads to her death. And, uh, Rocky's a guard again. <laughs> I've two nights watched with you, and yet can sense no truth in your report. When was it she last walked? Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, take her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed, yet all while in a most fast sleep. A great perturbation in nature, to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. Now in this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual performances, what else have you heard her say? That, sir, which I will not report after her. You may to me, and tis most me you should. Neither to you nor anyone have no witness to confirm my speech. Lo you, here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her, stand close. How came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. It stands by her continually. Tis her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye, but their sense is shut. What is this she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I've known her to continue in this quarter of an hour. And here's a spot. She speaks. I, I should set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out, damned spot, out, I say. One, two, why, then tis time to do it. Oh, hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie! A soldier and a fear. What need we fear who knows it, when no one can call our power into account? Dude, who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him? Did you mark that? The fate of five had a wife. Where is she now? What, will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You marvel of this starting. Go to, you have known what you should not. She has known what she should not, I know that. Heaven knows what she has known. Yet here's the smell of blood still. 
all the perfumes in a bright yellow mesh suite in this little hand. <laughs> what a size there. The heart is sorely charged. I have not had such a heart in my bosom for dignity of the whole body. Well, well, well. Pray God it be, sir. This, this disease is far beyond my practice. I've known those who have walked in their sleep and then who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands, put on your nightgown, and look not so pale. I tell you that again, Ben Quo is buried. He cannot come out one's grave. Even so? To bed, to bed, there is knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. Will she go now to bed? Directly. I tell thee, foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she the divine than the physician. Ask thee. Look after her. Move of her the means of all annoyance, but still keep eyes on her. So good night. My mind she has made it and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not. Good night, good doctor. In this monologue from Richard III, Lady Anne, played by Jace, is in mourning. She is the widow of King Henry VI's son, Edward, and she enters the royal castle with a group of men, played by Sarah, bearing the body of Henry VI. She curses Richard, played by Carter, for having killed King Henry, portrayed by Jackson Campbell. In this dramatic scene, Anne curses Richard as the murderer of her husband and father-in-law, and points to the bloody wounds on the corpse of the dead Henry, saying that they have started to bleed. According to Renaissance tradition, the wounds of a murdered person begin to bleed again if the killer comes close to the corpse. What? Do you tremble? Are you all afraid? Alas, I blame you not. Revenge his death. O oh, earth, which this blood drinkest, revenge his death. I the heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead. Earth gape open wide and eat him quick. As thou dost swallow up this good king's blood.
In our next scene from Romeo and Juliet, the dignified Lady Capulet, portrayed by Pema, is trying to convince her daughter, Juliet, played by Amber, to marry the noble Paris. Juliet isn't quite ready for marriage, but she is respectful of her mother. Distracting everyone from the serious subject is the comedic nurse, played by Eli, who is Juliet's closest confidant and has essentially raised her from birth. When Juliet's age comes up, the nurse, the nurse joyfully recounts several inappropriate stories from Juliet's youth, making Juliet and her mob uncomfortable and irritated. A servant enters at the end to remind them all that they are late to their own party, the party where Juliet will ultimately meet Romeo. Now, by my maidenhead at twelve-year-old, I bade her come. What lamb? What ladybird? God forbid, where is this girl? Juliet. Juliet? Juliet! How now? Who calls? Your mother! Madam, I am here. What is your will? This is the matter. Nurse, give leave a while. We must talk in secret. Nurse, come back again. I have remembered me. That's here I counsel. Thou knows my daughter is of a pretty age. Faith, we can tell her age in two an hour. She's not fourteen. I'll lay fourteen of my teeth. And to my teeth be it spoken, I have but four. Uh, she's not yet fourteen. How long is it now to lend us time? A fortnight in all days. Even her out of all days of the year. Come, let me see that night shall she be fourteen. Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age. But Susan is with God now. She was too good for me. But as I said, come, let me see that night shall she be fourteen. That shall she. Mary, I remember it well. Tis since the earthquake eleven years, and she was weaned. I never shall forget it. For I had laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove house wall. Oh, and my lord and you, within a mantua. May I do bear brain. But as I said, when I did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my tug, to see it touchy and fall out with the dug, shake! Quoth the dove house, <laughs> and twas no need I trow to bid me trust. <laughs> For by that time she could stand alone, nay, by the rood, she could have run and waddled all about. For even the day before she broke her brow. <laughs> My husband, <laughs> God be with his soul, I was a merry man. <laughs> Took up the child. Yes, yeah, quoth he. Dost thou fall upon thy face? <laughs> thou don't fall backward when thou hast more wit. And wilt thou not, too, pretty fool, stinted, <laughs> except I? Oh. oh, my dear, to think how a jest has all come about. <laughs> and by my holiday, I should live a thousand years, and I never shall forget it. Wilt thou not, Jewel? Pretty fool! Stint! <laughs> and said I! <laughs> and now from this, I pray thee, hold thy peace. Yes, madam. <laughs> <laughs> but I cannot choose but to laugh to think she should wake crying and said I she had a bump as big as a young cockerel stone of perilous My husband took up the child and said <laughs> God mark 
be to his graces. What if thou wert the prettiest babe that I e'er nursed? To see thee married at once I'd have my wish. Mary? That Mary is the very thing I came to talk of. Tell me, daughter Julia, how stands your disposition to be married? It is an honor that I dream not of. An honor? If were I not thine only nurse, I would say thou hast sucked wisdom from thy teeth. <laughs> well, think of marriage now. Here in Verona, younger than you, ladies of esteem are made already mothers. By my count, I was your mother much upon these years that you are now a maid. Thus, then, in brief, the valley of Paris seeks you for his love. Paris. A man, young lady, lady, such a man. Why, well, he's a man of all the world. He's a man of wax. Girl, summer hath not been a flower. No, a flower, and faith a very flower. Sorry. <laughs> what say you? Can you love the gentleman? This night we shall behold him at our feast. Read o'er the volume of young Paris's face and find delight in it there with beauty's pen. Examine every married lineament and see how one another lends content. And what obscure in this fair volume lies find written in the margin of his eyes. This precious book of love, this unbound lover, to beautify him only lacks a cover. The fish lives in the sea and tis much pride, for fair without fair within to hide. That book in many's eyes doth share the glory that in gold clasps locks in the golden story. So shall you share all that you doth possess, that having him making yourself no less. No less! Nay, bigger. <laughs> Women grow by men. <laughs> Speak briefly, if you like the Paris love. I like to like if looking like you, but no more deep, I'll dark my eyes. Then your consent is restrained to make a fly. Madam! 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 <laughs> the guests have come. They what? The guests! <laughs> madam, the guests! Supper is served up. You called. My young lady asked for the nurse, curse of the pantry, and everything in extremity! I must head straight. I beseech you, follow straight. We follow thee. Juliet, the county stairs. <laughs> Go, girls, the happy nights, the happy days. In this famous monologue from the play Julius Caesar, we have the noble Mark Antony, a great Roman general, here portrayed by Jackson Graham. Julius Caesar, emperor of the Roman Empire, has recently been assassinated by his friend Brutus and many other senators who conspired against him and stabbed him to death. Mark Antony, one of Caesar's greatest allies and friends, is here to eulogize Caesar at his funeral in the Forum, but he is in a difficult position. The Roman citizens are in attendance and have been told by Brutus and the other conspirators that the, de the death of Caesar is a good thing for Rome. Here, Mark Antony must convince them that Caesar's death is a bad thing and that Caesar's killer, Brutus, is a traitor, not a hero of Rome. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do live after them. The good is oft interred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, as are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Was this in Caesar ambition? 
When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was an honorable Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, Brutus is an honorable man. I come not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart lies in the coffin there with Caesar's, and I must pause till it come back to me. Our final scene is from The Taming of the Shrew, which depicts the ultimate battle of the sexes. The cocky Petruchio, here played by Ada, plans to marry for money. He hears from his friend Hortensio, played by Eli, that he knows of the perfect woman to make his fortune. Catherine, portrayed by Carter, is that woman. She's the eldest daughter of Batista, played by Rocky, their final and finally named part, and she is a shrew, another word for an argumentative, ill-tempered woman. Catherine hates men and is so mean to them that no man wants to marry her, even though she is beautiful, smart, and rich. Hortensio wants to marry Catherine's younger and sweeter sister, Bianca, but her father won't let the younger daughter marry until Catherine is married first. Good luck with that. Thus, Hortensio plans to get Catherine out of the way by having Petruchio marry her. Petruchio is sure that he can tame this shrew to get her money, but he may get more than he bargained for. This is a scene where they meet for the first time in the play. Good luck. Hey. How now, my friend? Why dost thou look so pale? For fear, I promise, if I look pale. What? Will my daughter prove a good musician? I think she'll sooner prove a soldier. Iron may hold her, but never lose. Why then thou canst not break her to the loot? Why not? Why not? For she hath broke the loot to me. I did but tell her she mistook the frets and bowed her hand to teach her the fingerings when with an impatient devilish spirit. Frets, you call these? Quoth she, I'll feel with them. <laughs> and with that word, she struck me over my head and threw the instrument my paint made way. <laughs> and there I stood amazed for a while. Because what else can you do? <laughs> Looking through the loot, as if on a pillory. She did call me a twangling jack and a rascal fiddler with twenty such wild terms she studied to misuse me so. Now, by the world, it is a lefty wench. I love her ten times more than I did. You're crazy. <laughs> and how I long to have some chat with her. Some chat, he says. Well, And be not so stumped. Proceed in practice with my younger daughter. She's apt to learn and thankful for good terms. Signor Petruchio, will you go with us? Or shall I send my daughter Kate to you? I pray you do, I'll attend her here. 
and woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail. Why, that I'll tell her plain. She sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown. I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses, newly washed with dew. Say she be mute and will not speak a word. Why, then, I'll commend her volubility and say she uttereth piercing eloquence. If she do bid me pack, I'll give her thanks, as though she bid me stay by her a week. And if she deny to wed, I'll crave the day when I shall ask the bays and one be married. But here she comes. And now, Petruchio, speak. <clears throat> Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Katarina, that do talk of me. You lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the curse. But Kate's the prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate. Her dainties are all Kates. And therefore, take this of me. Take this of me, Kate, of my consolation. <laughs> Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoken of, thy beauty sounded, though not so deeply as to these laws, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Move? In good time, let him that moved you hither remove your hands. <laughs> I knew you at the first you were immovable. Why, what's immovable? A joined stool. Thou hast hit it. Come sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee. For no one needs you but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you catch, but as heavy as my weight should be. <laughs> should be. Should buzz. Well taken, like a buzzer. Oh, slow winged turtle, shall a buzzer take thee? Aye, for a turtle, as he takes a buzzer. Come, come, you wasp, and think you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. <laughs> My remedy, then, is to pluck it out. Aye, the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does wear his stick? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours if you talk of tails. And so, hey. What, with my tongue in your tail? <sighs> Nay, come again, you Kate. I'm a gentleman. That I'll try. I swear I'll cut you if you strike again. So may you lose your arms. If you strike me, you are no gentleman. And if no gentleman, why then no arms? A herald, Kate. Oh, put me in my books. What is your crest? A cock's comb? A combless cock. So Kate will be my hen. No cock of mine. You crow too like a craven. Nay, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It's my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it to me. Had I a glass? I would. What, you mean my face? Well aimed of such a young one. Now by St. George, I am too young for you. Yet you are withered. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate. In sooth, you escape not so. I chafe you if I tarry. Let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Just told me you were rough and coy and sullen, but now I find the report a very liar, for thou art pleasant. Yay! <laughs> passing courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip, as angry wenches will. 
nor hast thou pleasure to be cross and talk. For thou with mildness entertainest thy wooers. <laughs> with gentle conference, soft and affable. Why does the world report that Kate doth lip? O oh, slanderous world, for Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender, and is brown of hue as hazelnuts and sweeter than the kernels. Oh, let me see thee walk. Thou dost not halt. Go, fool, in whom thou keepest command. Did ever thou ever oh, so become a grove, as Kate this chamber with her princely gate? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be Kate, and let Kate be chaste, and Diane sparkle. Where did you study this goodly speech? Tis extempore, from my mother wit. Witty mother, witless ulcer, son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine in thy bed. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms, Your father hath consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry agreed on. And will you? Will you? <laughs> I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn. For by this light, whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty which doth make me like thee well, thou must marry no man but me. For I am he am born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate as conformable as other household Kates. You with your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. Senor Petruchio, how speak you with my daughter? How but well, sir? How but well? It were impossible I should speed amiss. <laughs> and daughter Catherine, in your dumps? Call you me, daughter. Now I promise you, you shall be a tenderly fatherly regard to which you went to one half lunatic, a madcap ruffian, and a swearing jack that thinks with oaths to face the matter out. Father! Yourself and all the world have talked to her, have talked to Miss of her. If she be cursed, it is for policy. For she is not froward, but modest as the dove. She is not hot, but tempered as the morn. For patience, she will prove a second gristle and a roam in the crutches for her chastity. And to conclude, we have agreed so well together. That upon Sunday is the wedding day. I'll see thee hanged on Sunday first. Hard for Trujillo. Whoa. She says she'll see thee hanged first. Is this your speeding day? That good night on my part. Be patient, gentlemen. Be patient. I choose her for myself. <laughs> if she not be pleased, what's that to you? Was bargain twixt this twain, being alone, that she shall still be cursed of company. But I tell her. I tell you, tis incredible to believe how much she loves me. Oh, the kindest Kate. She hung about my neck. Take care of oh, 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 She rides so bad. Jeez. <laughs> Protesting oath on oath that in a tweet she won me to her love. Oh, you are novices. Tis a world to see how tame. When men and women are alone, a meacock wretch can make the cursed is shrew. Give me thy hand, Kate. How are you alive? <laughs> I will to Venice to buy apparel against the wedding day. Provide the feast father and with the guests. <laughs> I will be sure my Katarina shall be fine. I know not. 
What to say? <laughs> but give me thy hands. God send you joy, Petruchio. Tis a match. Amen. <laughs> say I. <laughs> we will be witnesses, I guess. <laughs> Father yeah. and wife I and gentlemen, I do. I will to Venice for Sunday come to pace. We will have rings and things and fine array. And kiss me, kiss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We will be married a Sunday. <laughs> Pfeiffer will send us off for the evening with a soliloquy by the fairy pop from Midsummer's Night's Dream. In this speech, he asks the audience for forgiveness if any of them have felt offended or hurt by the play. He reminds the audience that the play is nothing more than a dream. He also asks for applause. We hope that you'll take the same message from our show this evening. If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear. And this weekend, idle theme, no more yielding, but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. Else the puck a liar call, so good night unto you all. Give me your hands, if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends.